Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome back to Watchbox Studios. In fact, quite a few of you have already been with me for the last 20 minutes as we tried to reestablish our web link. There's a Rolex party going downstairs, and they are eating up our bandwidth. That said, we've got a phenomenal show tonight, starting with the ridiculous and working our way to the rational from the top. Remember, the watchbox.com is the best place to buy, sell, or trade watches. A lot of you in the chat box were talking to me before the broadcast started. We have a Swiss office. We have a Hong Kong office. Avail yourselves of our amenities globally. If you want to buy, trade, or sell and watch my videos, old school, check out the watchbox.com, now available regionally to import into your neck of the woods. Okay, jumping into batting practice. I always like to go for time to run where I name and shame the worst of the web. Today I am naming and shaming myself. That's right, our weekly catalog of horological infamy, mine this time. This time, watches I would buy after two shots of Knob Creek. Now, as Mike Michaels and F.P. Jorn learned firsthand, I apologize to both, two shots is right about where I start to lose my inhibitions. So not so bad that I fall asleep and wake up in a cab on the other side of the country, and yet at the same time, it's enough that I would buy something so far off the reservation that it's out of character. So now I'm not the type to get married by Elvis in a Las Vegas chapel when I'm a little bit under it, and I'm also not the type to be tastelessly tattooed not for me, personally, or buy a Fisker. At least not a second time. Fool me once, Henrik Fisker. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, right. But I'd absolutely drop serious coin on a watch that I probably couldn't choose without a little bit of liquid courage. So through the liquid lens, what would I buy? Well, I would say that through the Prism of Knob Creek, as seen through the eyes of Tim Masso, the Rolex Yachtmaster II in white, gold, and platinum starts to look pretty good. This is the 116689, the Albino Yachtmaster II. So this is the most expensive one, just over $48,000, not a cheap date. And I have to say, it's bigger and bolder than the stuff I'd normally wear, because, let's face it, it's a 44 millimeter solid gold Rolex. And yes, it's off-brand. I'm not a Rolex collector. That would be an orphan in my collection. I have a bunch of J. LCs. Some are that big. This is technically a 44, but this is not a 44 like that's a 44. Still, the consummate chronograph, a flyback with a 10-minute countdown, I'd probably use that chronograph more often than I use this Amvox 2. So that's the first outlandish watch that I would buy with 100 proof. Uh, shall, shall we say sales guidance? Uh, the Singer Track 1 Geneva Edition. Now, I'm not into yellow gold, and normally I wouldn't go off-brand, and I definitely wouldn't buy a watch that's co-branded with a Resto Mod car, but this thing is cool. You may say it sings to me. With a little bit of Knob Creek, it may sing to me enough that I would actually take the 72,000 Swiss franc plunge. Now, this is 1N yellow gold, which gives it a gorgeous aged, almost patinaed bronze look. It doesn't immediately re as yellow gold, and that's going to be a continuing theme in this segment. I will go for a colored gold watch, just generally not the brightest and most strident of yellow or rose. This thing is cool, though. It features the manual wind Aschengraf movement, so you basically have a scrolling hour and minute around the outside with all chronograph functions. We don't need to break our equipment twice tonight. Centralized on the dial. So this is a 43 millimeter yellow gold tonneau case. Would I buy this thing after two shots of Knob Creek? Probably, especially if it's Knob Creek rye. To be continued. Now, I will also say this, guys. Rolex Day Date 18039. Now we're going vintage crazy. Back in the Gordon Gecko era, this thing was the bomb and the flagship. Before the Yachtmaster 2, before the Sky Dweller, before the Daytona and Steel Rolex generally went thermonuclear, this was as good as it got. Back in the era when you had to pay 19, 000, you had to pay 19% on a house loan. So you're looking at a watch that's actually three co-molded metals. You've got white gold, yellow gold, and rose gold. In the links of the president bracelet, they're actually co-molded, so they align straight down the links. They don't meld, they don't become an alloy, they don't become a blend. They're completely co-molded and separate. This one's a little bit more special because it also has a mother of pearl dial in blue and a diamond set dial. This is a lot of bling for a guy with perhaps more modest tastes like myself. Therefore, this is a watch I would buy with the assistance of Knob Creek. Knob Creek, also doing vintage. 
who knew? Now, if you want to know more about the Tridor, it's often called the BIC, and it was made for the 18039 and 18239 generations ending in about 1999. This is a glorious throwback to the 80s. All right, big hair, big guitar, big drums. You guys know I'm into 80s rock, but this watch that I'm going to show you right now actually is a 2016 novelty that I loved at the time, and I actually wrote about it in an article for IW Magazine called The Revenge of Premium Quartz. That's right, we're going quartz, and we're going cushion case. It's the Piaget Emperador Cousin XL 700P. There's a lot going on here. First, a PVD bezel. I am not about PVD. I would need some assistance here. This is a cushion case with a quartz oscillator. What's going on here? Well, it's a Swiss iteration of Grand Seiko and Seiko's spring drive. The mechanism up where one o'clock would be is a generator wheel like the Seiko glide wheel. There is a micro rotor on the dial side. It is big and open and flamboyant and fabulous. All the things that my watches generally are not. Now, this is 76,000. Swiss francs and they made 118 of them. So how do you say spring drive en français? I don't know. We're going to have to go out to Côte d'Orfay and ask Piaget, but this is a watch that I would absolutely buy drunk. Now, this is a Rubicon I would need a lot of help to cross. I would never in my wildest dreams consider buying a watch from the following brand, the Bet Noir of horology purist, but I gotta say, I kind of like the Hublot Big Bang Mecha 10 in King Gold. This is a crazy watch, guys. You gotta forgive me here. But this is a watch that, to my eye at least, looks like aged bronze. Yes, it's 18 karat gold. Yes, it's as hard as ceramic. And yes, early examples of the magic gold compound had a tendency to chunk and fracture like ceramic. Well, all of that has been fixed. I was at the birth of the Mecha 10 at Basel World 2016, so I got a soft spot in my heart for this one. Afterwards, the next year, we saw the magic gold version. So you get gold that's 18 karat, that's as hard as ceramic and won't scratch, that looks like bronze and comes with a manufacturer 10 day power reserve movement that actually looks like Meccano or an Erector set. Meccano if you're from Europe, Erector set if you're from the States. But it's the same thing. It's like a big boy toy that's also 100 meters water resistant and has these lovely belt buckle pull tab quick release lugs. I adore this thing. Probably not something I would buy sober, but give me a little taste of the good stuff. Bonded bourbon and Hublot, they go together like fish and chips. Which, by the way, is an excellent dive food for once you've had a few. Okay, moving on now. Send your time to run Hall of Shame watch listings from the far reaches of the internet to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. The bad watch listings will come back next week, and I want you guys to send me the worst of the worst. Hands falling off, damage, unrepresentative photos, photos that are stock, boxes that aren't the right boxes, and papers that aren't the right papers. Send them to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, Parker S. asks, Tim, what is the difference between silicone and silicon, and which one is used in watch? Watches. Well, they both are, Parker. Here's the thing. Silicon is a crystalline solid, basically a hard flaky material, uh, almost as flaky as I am, that was introduced to mainstream watchmaking in 2001 with the UN Freak. Now, there it was used in the escapement and the dual direct impulse escapement that debuted with that first freak. This was a breakthrough. It was an industry first, a landmark watch. That's not the first freak. That's just my personal favorite. Now, by mid-decade, silicon's potential as an unlubricated and anti-magnetic movement component had found embrace by Patek Philippe. And you can actually see the Asilomax, Pulsimax, and Gyromax SI components right there with the Spiromax hairspring. Today, it's used by many others. So you've gone from the full set with Patek Advanced Research to silicon now finding its way into watches that cost under $2,000. Now, silicone is a material that's actually um, a silicon material with extra oxygen molecules added to create a gummy texture. So silicone is used for human anatomical implants and also for watches with straps that need to be unusually transparent, soft, or cost-effective, which is why you'll see a lot of basic Seiko straps, rubber straps for divers and silicone, Swatch watch straps and silicone, and the Hublot Big Bang Sapphire series actually uses a silicone strap across the whole range to get that beautiful transparency and supple feel on the wrist. So that's the difference between silicon, which is generally a movement component, and silicone, which is almost always used for straps and generally cheaper straps. Now, 
What watches, you guys tell me in the chat box, and I'll read some of these responses, but what watches would you guys buy after you've had a few drinks, and what drink would be your choice? Let me know, and I'll read them off as we get through the show. Moving on, we got a great pivot here. Um, I'm going to pivot to my personal taste and objective advice, because Sammy C. asks a question to which we can all relate, which is, Tim, what would be your ideal three-watch Omega collection if you had to choose from current models? Okay, so i got to pick three Omegas. It's going to be a collection of three, definitive as best I can, and current. So I can't take anything that's vintage or back catalog. Let's start with the obvious. Okay. Speedmaster Moonwatch CK2998. This is the new model for 2018. You remember the watch from 2016. That one was all blue with a loomed tack. This one features a few cool refinements. If we can go full screen on this. This is a watch that features a panda style dial, a blasted dial finish, and while the tachometer bezel, it's not a tack, the bezel is still ceramic. It's a pulsation scale, and the ceramic is inlaid with white enamel. Panda dial, blasted surface, alpha hands, with an actual biplanar dial, a recessed minute track outboard. It's got a little bit of a Paul Newman effect going on here, and I love the combination of the panda with the red accents. While I love the 2016 original, this limited edition of 2,998 pieces will probably age better as the proliferation of blueberry watches in the current era will date those watches. This, I think, is going to look just as good in 50 years. So that's an awesome watch, 39.7mm uh, steel case, straight lug, caliber 1861, the traditional manual wind, note, sapphire, crystal, not plexiglass. Okay, next, you gotta have a Seamaster, and the one to have is the 25th anniversary. This year at Basel World 2018, Seamaster Diver 300m, now 42mm, still a steel case here with the glorious Omega Wave, the Seamaster Wave dial, it is back, but it's back in ceramic. A gorgeous watch now with a spectacular 55 hour power reserve 8800 series coaxial, no longer the 2500. That's a lot of watch for the money and you're going to pay 4850 for this one, about 6500 for the Speedmaster we just saw, so we're not breaking the bank. Moving on, that watch by the way, 25 years young, I have the original Bond an all-timer. Finally, you do need a watch that's not a Speedmaster or a Seamaster, and I think the best play for today and tomorrow is the Constellation Globemaster in stainless steel with tungsten bezel. I'm going to go with a strap, and I'm going to go with a blue dial. This is the way I would have mine. Now, this is a watch that came out in 2015. It's a master chronometer, so it's got all the latest Metas certified tech. 39 millimeter case with the tungsten carbide fluted bezel. You have something genuinely different. It's $6,900, as you see it right there, and it's original, it's elemental, gorgeous, raw, it has the, yes, it has some vintage elements like the Pie Pan Constellation dial, but it's not a reissue, it's not a tribute watch, it's not a retro watch, which is why I think, in spite of the blue accents, this one's going to age well. Glorious little Constellation Observatory marquee on the case back. It has a nod to history without being a slave to history, and also, a gorgeous piece. 39 will wear well forever. Bonus. Here's the bonus. If you want a wild card, you want something that's off the beaten path, this is what you need. You need the new Seamaster Trimetal, dominated by titanium and tantalum. No date. Check that out. Titanium wave dial, Sedna red gold elements. You'll also note a combination of tantalum, which featured on that first 1993 Seamaster 300 series used in elements of the bezel and the bracelet. It is a gorgeous tritone. They're making 2,500 of these. No date, beautiful, versatile, two-tone that I can actually, I can endorse without any assistance from Liquid Courage from Bourbon's Best. This is a watch that costs $13,000, and I don't think you will ever lose on it. A rare two-tone watch that I don't believe will ever be worth less than you pay for it. Okay, did I get it right? Let me know in the chat box. Bump, 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 and I can see Eric Nielsen saying that is the Globe Master to have, and I absolutely, absolutely agree right there. I think it's important to uh, say we have Roy Anderson recommending Highland Park to people who are new to whiskey. It's an easy drink and very good. Uh, Lacavulin is another story, and I can see Ryan H. saying he would buy, uh, with booze, he would buy a Gior... A Dior Chief Rouge, and I can see Anthony O saying he would buy a Thomas Pressure after a few whiskeys. Uh, 
all good stuff, guys. I can't really object to any of the any of the liquor or even any of the watches you're mentioning. There's nothing that's crazy in there as an Hublot Big Bang and gold. Okay, I appreciate it. Keep chiming in. I can see Peter K saying 18-year Glen Livet and the Alonco Unzona Grand Longa One Ice Blue Dial Daymatic Moon Phase. Okay, I see you right there, and I feel you. I'm a Longa fan myself. Now, moving on, Graham P. asks, Tim, how do you feel about engraved watches? And that's a great question because I have strong feelings. Okay, do you believe they should be reverted to factory condition? Controversy, a little bit, more to come. But I would say, first, is the engraving offensive, jarring, or in poor taste? Is it on some part of the watch that's unavoidable, like a diamond bezel, something you just can't get away from by turning the watch over? If yes, I say replace. All other occasions, I say no, and here's why. First, after a point, it almost becomes part of the watch's recoverable past. How often do you encounter a 1950s watch with boxes, papers, and original sales invoice? Uh, an engraving might be your only link to the watch's history, and I actually had a vintage Vacheron Constantin, 6099 that came through. This was the Jubilee reference from 1955. This one was engraved 1957 with a personal inscription on the back. To me, that tells you something about when the watch was originally gifted and a little bit about its backstory that will never be recovered with boxes and papers because they don't exist anymore. So keep them. For some reason, things become more endearing with time, and personal inscriptions are one of them. Is the engraving anachronistic? Is it a throwback? Does it have character? For example, is it dated in a way that enhances the period charm of the watch? For Look right here. 1920 to 1950, this is presented to a former employee of Standard Oil Company of California. I'm willing to say that the owner and the company both don't still exist. If you have something that says Standard Oil of California, 25 years with the Pennsylvania Railroad, 23 years repairing Remington electric shavers, keep it. Keep it. And if the component on which the engraving exists is essential to the watch's integrity, that VC, as shown, would threaten all of the following if you tried to replace that part. First, it cannot be refinished without replacing the part, so you're going to need another one. Second, replacements for this ultra-thin from 1955 to 1957, not available. Vacheron doesn't have them. And finally, removal. If you wanted to put like a steel piece or a custom-made brass piece on there, it would remove original fabric. And to me, that compromises the watch in an unacceptable fashion. Here, it's factory. It's, it's modified, but it's factory. You replace that case back with a homemade or an aftermarket solution, it's no longer factory. And finally, actual historical importance. And you will know this when you encounter it. Douglas MacArthur's Reverso should not be refinished, nor should it be recased. This isn't always so obvious, but if you have military unit markings, a family coat of arms, uh, a name that might have some relation to important historical events, such as a Dunkirk evacuation survivor, these are all things to be preserved. Keep them. They're part of the watch's story. Nine times out of ten, I say do not replace or polish. Please do not polish an engraved case back. Right. Now, moving. my th this, this I needed to think over, guys, because you asked and you asked and you asked, and I didn't want to give you a knee jerk, and I didn't want to be relentlessly negative because everyone else talking about bomb right now has just been Debbie Downer. So let me give you my thoughts on Richemont's new entry-level play, Balm. What is it? Why might it succeed? Why might it fail? And then one brand in the entry level that is doing everything right. Okay, Balm. It is a new entry-level watch line under Richemont, the corporate parent of companies like Cartier, Mont Blanc, IWC, JLC, and Panerai, to be managed by Baum and Mercier, but separate in practice. All sales will be online. Now, sustainability is being highlighted as a selling point. No animal products, recycling plays a role, or recyclability will play a role, and packaging will be minimal. Two lines, the Iconic series, which will be the upscale of the two, it will feature the mechanical options, and that's one example right there, and they will actually feature Miyota automatic movements from Japan. Japan. A few options here. Now, custom timepiece series, all quartz so far, starting at $560. You'll have color options, complication options, and strap options. So where does that leave us? Prices that run from $560 to about $1,100 United States. 
Why now? Price-sensitive youth market. Much has been said about the young of this age being fundamentally different from previous generations, preferring experiences, shared access goods, relationships, and divorcing from materialism. But Richemont has, and I actually agree, correctly deduced that most of this is actually just posturing by this generation and its analysts, designed to make the most of fraught economic circumstances, student debt issues, and gig economy levels of employment. If they overcome that, surveys have shown that these folks tend to prefer traditional cars, homes, and families when possible. So, Richemont is saying we make attainable a reality before all of the rest of that becomes possible. So, attainable can be within the reach of those who don't have the means, and you'll find that millennials are actually quite orthodox in their consumption when you give them a possibility. The gateway to luxury for this generation, the millennials, might lead to a longer footpath than the final destination. Um, in the past, we've seen previous generations pretty much jump directly from college to buying a Rolex Datejust. Maybe the bridge here is going to be something like a bomb timepiece. So, an Omega Seamaster Aquaterra, a date just, that might be all pipe dream for a generation that is choking with college loans and fighting to avoid health care. So, first, is this really custom? Does this herald more customization across the industry? I don't think so. Who is the target, age, gender? I'd say with 35 to 41 millimeter cases, they're going for men and women here. I would also say they're trying their damnedest to get women to buy in with uh, more delicate, effeminate, dress-oriented and, shall we say, compact models. That's probably the best way to describe a 35 millimeter watch in the modern era. So I would say they're competing with Federic Constant and Nomos on the high end. Seven Friday and Christopher Ward brand-wise are the targets. Now, why might this succeed? First, attractive price. It's an attractive price. $560. That's something most millennials can scrounge up if they try. An alternative to disposable products on the mech models, maybe the Iconic series gives them the first watch that they're not inclined to simply throw away when it dies. And online-only sales might be more approachable than boutiques, which can be intimidating to younger people and those not versed in watches. And finally, effective marketing remains to be seen, but maybe this is effectively marketed to millennials. We'll see, but Richemont, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. You're trying something new. I would also say there's the possibility that they could market with placement, commercials, ambassadors, ads in media, not typically populated by watch pitches. Be creative. Take this outside the bounds of the magazine ad and the clumsy advertisement during a golf tournament. It's not relevant to this market. That's not to say there aren't going to be opportunities. And finally, there's always the unexpected or unintentional good fortune. If someone like Elon Musk or Bernie Sanders or Jennifer Lawrence shows up wearing one of these sincerely unsponsored in public. It could create a windfall in publicity or coolness. Basically, what Sly Stallone did for Panerai unsponsored during the 90s, albeit on a watch that costs less than a Panerai cost during the 90s. Now, Richemont could push forward relentlessly with this, persist with it, even if it doesn't succeed out of the gate. And it might be that after a few generations of the product, maybe in 2025, the third generation of bomb watches really catch on. I don't know. Crazier things have happened. It took a while for Infinity to take root in the United States, and Lexus wasn't introduced to Japan for about 15 years. So anything's possible. Now, why might this fail? There's been a lot of dwelling on this, but let's be realistic. First, strange design choices. Wire lugs, hinge lugs, how about both combined? Bomb is there. I'm not sure there was any demand to get there. Also, online-only purchase experience. This is a double-edged sword because it shreds any semblance of a luxury experience. It's purely transactional, exactly the same as if you were ordering bulk kitty litter off of Amazon. Buying a watch entirely online without at least having a phone conversation with someone who gets watches and connects with you, I don't see why that's a, a bridge to luxury. That's just what people do anyway these days. So an irrelevant buying experience to make the watch cheaper, I do think it takes away from the total ownership experience and impression. I would also say, at least when I go to buy a Mini, I walk into a BMW dealer and I see BMWs. It would be one thing if you had to walk into a Balm & Mercier or an IWC dealer to get a Balm watch. Now, you're pretty much just opening another window amid your browsing for YouTube cat videos, and hopefully this YouTube channel as well. So. 
Keep in mind that as a tenant brand of Baum and Mercier, it's going to be a little bit confusing. It draws on Richemont's weakest Western brand name to try to make its debut. If you're going to launch, launch off of IWC, Panerai, or Cartier. Baum and Mercier is big in Asia, not so much in Western Europe in the United States or North America. Plus, junior brand stigma, being the junior brand of something else hurts. Remember the Geo Metro? Those were sold by Chevrolet. That Geo Metro is way too metro for me. Nothing about that makes me want to move up to a Chevy. It makes me want to run. So keep in mind, you have to present something with a semblance of luxury. And being the junior brand of Baum and Mercier might not cut it in this day and age. As much as I like Baum and Mercier, Balm is a path beyond. Now, finally, there's the Scion effect. Scion. It was Toyota's youth brand here in the United States. And there's nothing worse than saying to a youth market, hey, kids, we made this just for you. That translates to, yeah, my mom's going to buy that. My grandpa will buy that. Kids are not going to buy that. They don't respond to that pitch. They have to hear it's for someone more prestigious and accomplished than you. Then they'll want it. Finally, these are mainly quartz watches priced under $1,000. And let's get real. Quartz watches priced under $1,000 are on the track with the train coming, and the train is the smart watch. Swiss watches priced below 500 Swiss francs, below 1,000 Swiss francs, have been decimated. Brands like diesel, brands like... Fossil and its many sub-brands, its tenant brands, have been hit hard by the smartwatch. And up to this point, Richemont didn't have to worry about that because it went nowhere near that market or that price point. Now, Richemont is voluntarily stepping into that world with a product that, frankly, is a little bit weird and maybe not in a good way. I don't see that as a place Richemont wants to be. Uh, finally, I would say that for $1,100, you could buy one hell of an Oris. And young people are internet savvy. If they're looking for bomb, they probably already know about eBay, Chrono24, and pre-owned dealers like Watchfinder and Watchbox, which means they'll realize that for the price of a bomb, they could get a hell of a pre-owned Oris that's a legitimate luxury watch. And finally, it's not a sports watch, guys. This is starting on the back foot. If you're going to offer a one and only to get someone into the watch market, people think Rolex. They think Tag Heuer. They think Omega. They think Breitling when they think luxury watches. Give them something that costs less but at least looks the part. The Balm watches don't. They're a little bit off even for dress watches. So that's a strange place to start off on the back foot. Now, positive energy. Let's talk about good things, because I don't want to be relentlessly negative. Here's a company doing what Balm is trying to do, but doing it right with a true luxury sense of special, enduring, and worthwhile product. So, the hidden jewel of the Swatch Group, Mido, is doing it all right. You haven't heard of Mido. Let's talk about them a little bit. First, they are the hidden jewel from a design standpoint. The design standpoint, they ace it. Dress watches, special editions like this Guggenheim inspired by Architecture Limited series, and everything from vintage reissues to sports watches to dress watches to all-arounders. Most mega brands like IWC, JLC, Panerai are imbalanced and dependent on one class or product. Even Rolex hasn't found a way to get Cellini to work. That looks awesome. That's a radial date watch with gorgeous lugs. And that's a watch that costs under 1500 bucks. Now, consider this. Features and value. The Commander Auto from Mito. This is a watch that costs 1170 US dollars and will compete with the top-of-the-line Balm Iconic. What do you get? Well, you get an automatic winding 80-hour power reserve. You get a COSC chronometer certification. You get a date date. You get it in a steel case that's a versatile 40 millimeters with sharp styling that will look great in 10 years. No weird wire lugs, no bizarre dial layouts, no quirky name that sounds like a part of a bigger, better brand. This is cool. And I'm also going to say that the Baron Cellie SI is even better. 40 millimeters also in steel, sapphire crystal on both of these watches. This is a watch that costs $1,130. It's 40 millimeters in steel, a COSC certified Swiss chronometer. It has a silicon hairspring, an 80 hour power reserve, and not only is it serviceable, but Mito is doing something that no one is doing. Only a handful of brands will tell you what it costs to service their watches. 
Mito gives you service costs listed on its website. So not only are all of these watches heirloom quality that can be serviced again and again, but they tell you the price of everything. Chronometer certified, not chronometer certified, quartz, mechanical, old calibers and gold watches. They even say call in. They'll service a vintage Mito. This is as good as it gets and they give you a full schedule of prices. I admire their openness as much as I admire the quality of their watches. I would absolutely buy their inspired by architecture watch. This is quietly one of the top COSC clients. We know that from 2011 to 2015, when COSC certification stopped being released by brand, uh, we know that every year Mito was either fourth or fifth on the list behind Rolex, Breitling, Omega, Tag Heuer, as one of the, and Tiso as one of the top certifiers of chronometers in the business, generally without... Getting too detailed, about 50,000 chronometers a year from Mito. That's a great number for a company that sells most watches below 2,000 bucks. And I'll also say this. Do we even know whether the bomb watches are going to be serviceable? Finally, keep this in mind. Mito is selling a luxury product that you can go into a Mito boutique and buy. That's the Inspired by Architecture watch. Again, I adore it. $1,590. I'm into it. When Waco was here, we talked about it. He was impressed by the watch. This is cool. This is how you do an offbeat watch that doesn't stink. That's a watch that's got hinge lugs, and I adore it. Lugless, chronometer, silicon, hairspring, textured, grained dial, all of that, and it actually looks like the Guggenheim without being cloyingly weird on your wrist. So, Mito, you guys should be the textbook for the second generation of Balm watches. I commend you and I salute you. Now, industry news. Swiss watch exports for April 2018. Shifting gears here, the trend remains up and growth accelerated significantly in April of 2018, plus 13.8% in value delivered. Now, the USA, this was big, the second largest unitary market for Swiss watches behind Hong Kong is finally showing a durable upward trend. USA is up 9.8% for the year from January to April. So USA, I'm glad to see the number one true national watch market. And of course, my home market is bouncing back. Now, Hong Kong's imports were incredible. Three times the global percentage increase, over 43%. That was the increase in Swiss watch exports to Hong Kong for April. That is huge because Hong Kong is a shopping and distribution hub for the enormous East Asian watch marketplace. If you include Greater Asia, 50% of Swiss exports go there, and a lot of those buyers buy through Hong Kong. So this is huge for the watch market globally. Now, was there a downer? Yes, someone failed to make the party, and in this case, it was the UK, which saw a monthly 15% crash in value delivered. Tough times for Swiss watches in the UK. Britain, you got to join the party. The good times are now. The good old days or this instant. Okay, high value watches. How good are the good old days happening right now? Well, they are the leading gainers. I mentioned that cheap watches are in the crosshairs. Even they did okay. The sub 500 Swiss franc market did well. Doing better, the 500 to 3000 and up Swiss watch segment. So you can see luxury watches, steel, steel and gold, and precious metal all gaining. And the important thing is if you look at the breakdown by materials, precious metals were one of the largest percentage gainers. So so the appetite for the truly premium watch is reviving itself. I look forward to seeing May when available, but right now in the watch space, the news is good. Okay. Viewer wrist shots. Let's throw some up. Russell K sharing his Ulysse Norden Tellurium part of the trilogy of time, as well as his personal Cavallino Rampante. Richard R. is in the Big Easy, New Orleans, with his Rolex GMT Master II, BLNR, the blue and the black. I can see Amintas N., a man after my own heart, a longtime client and friend, with his Jager Lecoult Master Compressor Extreme World Alarm, World Time and Alarm, the watch I famously threw in blue. He's got the red one. Inland Sailor... Well, we've got our friend from the Austrian Alps sailing. This is Ivilo P. with his Oris Aquis Day and Date. Best article of the week. I would be remiss not to mention the biggest news in watches this past week. 
from the best journalist in the business. This is uh, from Watches by SJX. Why are watchmakers entering the secondary market? By watchmakers, he means manufacturers. And, of course, Watchfinder was purchased by Richemont late last week. A big story. So in the immediate wake of Richemont's purchase of Watchfinder, SJX is analyzing the situation. This is not an isolated purchase or business move. Starting with tentative steps by Audemars Piguet and F.P. Journe in the last two years, we've seen manufacturers start to try to get a handle on pre-owned watches. First their own, but then later perhaps the market as a whole. Now, the segment started to erupt in earnest last fall when our own watch box was capitalized to the tune of $100 million. So we entered the pre-owned space globally in a big way with the money to match. Uh, by CMIA Capital Partners, we are actually a Hong Kong-based company. A lot of folks think we have a peripheral office out there. That's actually our home. This is the satellite. Now, Europe's Bucherer, the largest watch dealer in Europe and a billion euro company, actually acquired U.S.-based Tourneau in February in a move expected to strengthen both Bucherer's U.S. position. It really had no presence here aside from its Carl F. Bucherer distributors, that's its captive brand, and also a move expected to strengthen Bucherer's pre-owned competence because Tourneau has over 1,300 pre-owned watches listed, which is second in the U.S. to our 1,700. So it's good to be second. It's better to be first. The point is Bucherer is getting into this in a big way through Tourneau. Now, finally, SJX offers three important conclusions. This There will be a link to this in the description box. So if you're watching this recorded, that's where you can find the link. He says first, Richemont is looking to end gray market closeouts, and this is absolutely true. They will sell their closeouts as pre-owned watches through their boutiques and their pre-owned organs, probably through Watchfinder. So gray market at some mom and pop shop suddenly becomes a Watchfinder pre-owned watch. Second, Richemont is looking to prop up pre-owned markets. FP Journe got into the pre-owned segment first and foremost because it wanted to help support the value of its watches on secondary markets and at auction. It really doesn't control the pre-owned markets. We own more vintage and rare FP Journe than FP Journe does, but it's important to try to prop up the selling prices of your used watches. For the equity of the brand, Richemont is now going to try to do this across its many tenant brands. Finally, and this is where XJS, XJX really hits the nail on the head, Richemont Company stores, which account for over 50% of Richemont's income, so boutiques, brand boutiques, uh, they will begin to take off-brand trades, which means if you want to trade a Tag Heuer, a Rolex, a Zenith, if you want to trade in a Bulgari, if you want to trade in a Tudor, you can now do that at an IWC boutique, or you will be in the short term. You will be able to do that and buy a new Portugueser, a new Pilot's watch, by trading in a watch that in the past, Richemont would have had no way to sell. And they wouldn't have had the pricing data from Watchfinder's now 16 years of operation to know what to offer offer on a trade. So I think they're going to play it cool for one year. Figure out how to price a trade, make that operative at all of their brand boutiques, build up a war chest. Watchfinder failed in Europe. Watchfinder has no presence in the U.S. Richemont will start taking trades of off-brand watches, figuring out how to price pre-owned acquisitions. About a year from now, that inventory will find its way into a European continental-based euro demarcated or denominated Watchfinder business. And in the United States, you'll see some sort of Watchfinder North America that will be seeded with the watches taken on trade in the past year. So I think that's where we're going right now. And SJX really captures all of that in the best article of the week. Okay, finally, viewer wrist shots. We got a few more friends and a few more favorites. John V of Oyster Bay. I grew up right next to it in Huntington Cold Spring. He's treating us to a sensational macro shot for once of his Chopard LUC caliber 196, so named because it was developed in 1996 by Chopard and Parmigiani, Michel Parmigiani, Geneva Seal, Micro Rotor, and All Timer, one of the greats. Walt Odette once called it equal to the best of Vacheron and Patek Philippe. Congrats, man. That's a haul. Christopher P. from Australia shares his Grand Seiko SBGT 241G day and date. Mark P. styles with his Surtee stoned Rolex Submariner, uh, apparently during Miller time, and Saving the best for last, everything comes full circle here on the Watchbox. Dave L. of Westfield, Massachusetts shares a pair of my favorite things, a Blancpain 50 Fathoms, my favorite dive watch, and a bottle of Knob Creek Rye. Man, did you read my mind? You did. We have come full circle. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. I am out of breath. I am out of water. I am out of material. 
comment and subscribe. Comment in the box below. It's the best place to interact with me. And check me out, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram with Watchbox Global too. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Tim. They're the crew. They worked a miracle, heaven and earth. They moved a mountain to get us alive tonight. Thank you to them. Thank you to you. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Thank <laughs> you.